All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about the force of interest. And a quick disclaimer, unlike some of the other lessons in this series, there's not gonna be any example problems at the end of this video. So if you wanna see example problems that involve using the force of interest, I would recommend you watch our example video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description. But if you don't know anything about the force of interest, this video will be very good at showing you what it is, where it comes from, and its different applications. So I wanted to get that out of the way first because if you were someone who's looking for example problems, this is not the video for you, unless you're really struggling with the concept of the force of interest, then this will be very helpful. But let's get started. So let's consider a scenario where we have an accumulated value of an investment, this A of T, where that T is measured in years. And so if we were interested in knowing the amount of interest earned by this investment in a one half year period from time T to a time T plus one half, right? Whatever time we are starting with T and in another half year or a semi-annual period, then the amount of interest earned for that period of time from T to T plus one half would be the following. We would have the accumulation at time T plus one half minus the original amount we started with, right? So if you wanna know how much interest you earned in one period, you would take what you started with and subtracted what you had at the end of that period, right? If I put $100 into an account, it had a 5% interest rate for the year. At the end of the year, I would have $105. So if I subtracted the original 100 that I started with, from that $105, I would be left with $5, and that would be my interest. And so that's the same thing for this scenario. If I wanna know the amount of interest of a time plus one half of a year from where I started, then this would be that amount. And so then if I wanted to know the interest rate for that period, I would just take that amount, right, and divide it by the amount that I started with, that A of T, which in our case that I said earlier would be that $5 divided by $100. And that would give us that 5% interest rate because five divided by 100 is 0 0.05. And so this equation right here would be equal to our effective semi-annual interest rate for this one half year period from T to T plus that one half of a year. But what if we wanted this interest rate to be a nominal annual rate that was convertible semi-annually, where our M is equal to two, right? What do we do if we want this rate to be a nominal annual rate convertible semi-annually? Well, then our equation would look like this. We would have I, where M is equal to two, the number of periods in a year is two, divided by two is equal to that A of T plus one half minus A of T divided by A of T, right? We went from this effective semi-annual rate and we thought about what would be the equivalent annual nominal rate that is convertible semi-annually, which would be this right here, right? If we had a nominal rate that was convertible semi-annually and we divided it by that value of M, which is two, we would be left with the effective semi-annual rate. And so then if we were to solve for just this rate, if we were to multiply both sides by this two, then we would have that our nominal rate that's convertible semi-annually would be equal to two times that same equation. But what if we were to continuously increase the amount of times that this nominal annual rate is convertible, right? What if we changed M to three and then to four and five and so on, and we just increased it to infinity? What would that look like? What would the nominal annual rate that is convertible infinitely look like? Well, let's try to generalize this equation right here. Let's replace all of our twos with M so that we just have a general formula for an unspecified number of periods per year. And so that would look like the following. We would have I of M is equal to M times a of t plus one over m minus a of t divided by a of t. And so now we have a generalized form of this equation. And so now if we were interested in knowing what the nominal annual rate that is convertible infinitely, right, where that m would be infinity rather than a finite number, we can find what this is equal to using this equation. However, unlike before, where if our m was two, we could just plug in two for all of our m's. We can't do that for infinity because infinity is not a number that we can plug in. But this is where calculus is going to come into play. And hopefully you're familiar with limits from calculus because now we're going to be working with a limit of this function to see what happens as our m approaches infinity. And so consider this your calculus warning. We're going to be using calculus from here on out in this video. But to go back to what we're doing here, why are we even interested in this nominal rate that is convertible infinitely? Well, this is going to be the concept of the force of interest. The force of interest is that nominal rate that is convertible infinitely. And so let's find what this would equal by taking the limit of this function as m approaches infinity. 
All right, so this is the limit that we're gonna be working with here. The nominal interest rate that is compounded infinitely is going to be equal to the limit as m approaches infinity of this function. Now, this is going to be a very difficult limit to do in its current form. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set this one over m equal to another variable. So here's what I'm gonna say. We are going to let one over m equal h. That's going to be our new variable. And so if we did that, what would m itself be equal to? Well, if we solve for m in this equation here, we would have 1 is equal to h times m, and then that would give us that m is equal to 1 over h. So everywhere where we have a 1 over m, we'll replace it with h, and everywhere we have an m, we'll replace it with 1 over h. And so we'll do that next. So I have that this is equal to the limit as one over h approaches infinity. And then we will have, instead of m, we're gonna have that one over h. So we'll have one over h multiplied by the accumulation at time t plus one over m, which we are now switching to h. So we're gonna have h. And then we're gonna subtract the accumulation at time t. And this will be divided by a of t. And that is the end of that. Now, what does that allow us to do? What is the significance of that? Well, in order to see that, we gotta do one more thing. Instead of checking as one over h approaches infinity, I would rather have this written in a way that shows us what h is approaching itself. And so what I wanna write is have as h approaches some value. But what values of h would make this statement true? What values of h is gonna have one over h approaching infinity? If you look at the expression one over h, as you plug in smaller and smaller values of h, right, if I start with 0.1, one divided by 0.1 is going to be 10. And then if I went even smaller, let's say I went to 0 0.01, one divided by 0 0.01 would be 100. And then if I went to 0 0.001, one divided by 0 0.001 would be 1000. And so as h gets smaller, this quantity, one over h, gets larger towards infinity. And so what we can say is as h approaches zero, which is what we were doing there, as we pick those numbers closer and closer to zero, this expression approached infinity. And so we can rewrite this to just be as h approaches zero, and that's going to be the same thing. So as h approaches zero is the same thing as one over h approaching infinity. And so now the next thing I'm going to do is simplify this a little bit, and then I think it's going to click why this switch of variables was important to figuring out what this force of interest is going to be. And the first thing I'm gonna do is pull out this function on the bottom. So because our limit is of h approaching zero, this a of t will not be affected by that because it's defined with t, not h. And so we can pull it out of our function here. So if I do that, We'll have one over a of t times the limit as h approaches zero. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to replace the denominator with this h, right? We pulled this out, and so now let's put the h underneath instead, and we'll have a of t plus h minus a of t divided by h. And so now that is our new equation, and this is awesome. This is the best part of this whole video. Do you recognize what this limit is right here? Let me try to jog your memory by writing this limit. Do you remember this from calculus? The limit as delta x approaches zero of the following. f of x plus delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x. Does this ring a bell in any way? Well, this right here is the limit definition of a derivative, and this matches up with this limit right here. It's just a different function with different variables, right? We have the limit as h approaches zero, we have the limit as delta x approaches zero, and everywhere we have a delta x in our original definition, there's an h in our definition for this problem. And then of course our function is a of t rather than f of x. And so these two limits are the same thing. They both represent the derivative of their respective functions f of x and a of t. And so now we can rewrite this to be equal to one over a of t times the derivative or a prime of t. And then we can simplify this to write that this is equal to a prime of t divided by a of t. And so this is equal to our annual nominal rate that is convertible infinitely. And so this is what we are looking for. This is the force of interest right here. And so what we'll actually call this, instead of staying compounded infinitely, that's not really typically used, that's not a wording that you will hear. Instead, you're going to hear compounded continuously because it's just going to continue on forever. And this is called the force of interest. And most commonly, you will see the force of interest denoted 
with delta t. That is what you're going to see most often when talking about the force of interest. So now that we know what the force of interest is in terms of our accumulation function, let's look at how this works in terms of expressing simple interest and compound interest because we do know the accumulation functions for those two types of interest. So let's take a look at that next. All right, so we just found that the force of interest is equal to the derivative of our accumulation function divided by the original accumulation function. So let's use this to express our simple interest accumulation function. Right, recall that when we had the accumulation of an investment at time t, it was equal to the initial deposit times one plus the interest rate times t. This is what we used for simple interest. Well, if we wanna find the expression of the force of interest for the scenario, we would have the following. We would have delta t is equal to a prime of t divided by a of t. And if we plug that in, we're gonna be taking the derivative of this function with respect to t. First thing you wanna note is that because this initial investment is not defined with t, instead we have that zero, that is just a constant in this scenario. So that's not going to change. So if we work on our derivative here, it's just gonna be a of zero times the derivative of what is inside here. So now the derivative of one is just going to be zero, but then a derivative of i times t will just be i because when you take the derivative of a variable to the first power, the derivative is just going to be that coefficient, which in this case is i. So we're gonna have i, and then the bottom, we're just gonna have what our a of t is equal to, which in this case is this right here. So we're gonna have a of zero times one plus i times t. And so now if we simplify this, I see that we're gonna have a common factor of a of zero. So these are gonna cancel out. And then we can find that in this case, delta t is going to be equal to i divided by one plus i times t. And so this is the expression for what the force of interest is equal to in a scenario where you have a simple interest rate. But now let's look at the compound interest scenario. And so we'll go through the same process. We'll have that delta t is going to be equal to the derivative of a of t divided by the original function a of t. And this is going to be equal to the derivative of this. So once again, a of zero is going to be a constant, so we don't need to worry about that. We'll have a of zero. And this is going to be a little bit tricky. So let me just remind you, and I'm gonna write that up here, of what happens when we take the derivative of a function with an exponent. And so what I mean by that is, what did we do when we took the derivative d dx of a function like two to the x, right? We have some value to the power of the variable that you're taking a derivative with respect to, right? Well, this was equal to that same value, we have two to the x, times the natural log of the base of that exponent, which was two in this case. And so what would be the derivative of this function? Well, it would be that original quantity, so we'd have one plus i to the t, times the natural log of the base, which is one plus i. And so that's the derivative of this function, this right here. And then on the bottom, we're just gonna have the original function again, so we'll have a of zero times one plus i, to the t power. And so now in this case, these are gonna cancel just like they did in a simple interest scenario, but so will this quantity to the t power, right? That one plus i to the t is in the top and the bottom, so we cancel that out. And now all we are left with is that in the case of compound interest, the force of interest delta t is equal to the natural log of one plus i. And so that is our formula for the force of interest when you have a compound interest rate. And I mentioned this at the beginning of the lesson, but if you wanna see examples where we use these formulas that we're finding here, be sure to check out our examples video that I'll have linked in the description as well as at the end of this video. But before we call it quits, there's one more thing we have to look at here, and that is how do we use a force of interest rate if it's given in a present value or a future value scenario? Because we can use the force of interest to describe investment growth. So let's do that next. All right, so in order to describe investment growth using the force of interest that we found, we're gonna to have to recall one thing about derivatives. So remember that if we took the derivative, let's say d du with respect to u of the function, the natural log of u, how do we take the derivative of that function? Well, that would be equal to one over u times u prime, right? We would take whatever was inside the natural log and put it under one. We would take the reciprocal of that. And then we would multiply by whatever the derivative of that function is. If it was x, it would just be multiplied by one. But if it was x squared, it would be multiplied by two x and so on, right? And so if we look at this, what does this look like right here? If we rewrite this, we could say that this is equal to one over 
a of t times a prime of t. And so do you see a similarity between these two expressions? We have one over an original function times the derivative of that function, and we have one over u times the derivative of u. So because of that, we can express delta t as the following. We can say that this is equal to the derivative or ddt of the natural log of a of t. Now that's cool and everything, but why did we do that? What was the point of that calculation? Well, if we were to integrate this expression right here from time equals zero to some time in the future, t equals n, we'll just say n is some amount of years in the future, then we're going to have a very interesting result. And so let's do that next. So to reiterate what I said, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be taking the integral from zero to n of delta t with respect to t. And so this is going to be equal to the integral from zero to n of d dt of the natural log of a of t. And that's with respect to t. And so if we were to take the integral of this, remember that the integral of a derivative is just whatever function is inside that derivative, right? The integral and a derivative kind of cancel out in a way. And so this would just be equal to the natural log of a of t. And then we need to evaluate that from zero to n. And if we do that, this is going to be equal to the natural log of a at time n minus the natural log of a at time zero. And so then we can use one of our log properties to change this to the following form. This is gonna be equal to the natural log of a of n divided by a of zero, right? One of your log properties is if you have two logs with the same base, which in this case, they're both the natural log of two functions and they're subtracted, you can take the natural log of the first function divided by the second function, which is what we have right here. And so we have just a little bit more work to do here, but I need to make some more space. So let me clean up what we've got here just a little bit. All right, so let me rewrite what we have here. So we have that the integral from zero to n of delta t dt is equal to the natural log of a of n divided by a of zero, right? That is what we found from this process right here. And so what we're gonna do now is take both sides of the equation and make them the power of e, and that's going to allow us to remove this natural log here and then be able to work with our initial investment value here, right, this a of zero, and our future value, which is this a of n. And so if we raise both of these as a power of e, right, if we do this, we have e to the power of the integral from zero to n of delta t dt equal to e to the natural log of a of n divided by a of zero. Well, e and the natural log are going to cancel out, and so then we just have that e with that integral is equal to a of n divided by a of zero. And this is going to give us the result that if we wanna find the value in the future, right? if we multiply both sides by the initial investment here, a of zero, we will have that a of n is equal to a of zero times e to the integral from zero to n delta t dt. And this is what we have been working towards this entire time. This is the future value equation when you have the force of interest as your interest rate. And so then if you wanted to know the present value formula, you could actually solve for a of zero and you would find that as well. And so let me give you both of these equations to end this video. So here we have all the formulas we found in this video. We have the definition of the force of interest, then we have the conversion from the force of interest to an effective compound rate, and we have the conversion to a simple interest rate. And then we have the last formula we found for the future value of an investment. And this can be rewritten. Sometimes you will see this. Instead of writing E, you'll see EXP, which means the same thing as E, and then you'll have that same integral inside here. That's just so that you can write everything on one line rather than having to write all of this in a power every time when you're going through your work. This makes it a little bit easier to write nicely. And then our present value formula, which we did not explicitly solve for, but you could have solved it when we solved for this. All you would do is instead of solving for a of n, you would solve for a of zero. And you would find that because this quantity would have to switch from a denominator to a numerator, that the exponent of e would become negative. So that's really the only change here is that our initial investment or our present value and our future value swap places and our exponent becomes negative. And so these are the most important equations you need to know related to the force of interest. So if you wanna see some example problems using the force of interest, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments here. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.